What I've tried to do in my report is to ask why. What's the motivation for the main policies that seem to be problematic in the benefits area? And the answer that most people come up with is, oh, it's austerity. So in the UK and several other countries, we've had austerity and austerity was justified on the basis of a myth. The myth in, in this country was that government debt had never been so high, that this was unprecedented uh, in peacetime and therefore uh, a, a crisis would occur if we didn't immediately cut government spending. One of the ideas that isn't working anymore is the way that we frame, the way we talk about growth. And we, talk, we look at growth as something that we should always be aiming for, economic growth. And we're not talking about which part of the economy do we want to be growing. I'm in the healthcare and it's pretty easy to get a job. The problem is they pay you quite crappy. I've sent in CVs of mine that had 15 years experience in the healthcare. We're starting you with eight months standard, which I think is just, oh, absolutely ridiculous. The fact of austerity, which has caused a lot of problems, it's caused the climate emergency, it's caused mass impoverishment, and it's also causing rising rates of mental illness, struggling NHS, struggling police, struggling schools. We had a 1% pay cap for years and years and years, and this was obviously through when the economy was struggling. It did not keep up with inflation, so our pay in real terms just got worse and worse. The work we're having to do each day was increasing. The pay was technically decreasing. Well, I worked as a chef, that's a skill that I've learned. And I've moved on to a restaurant that was making four million pounds a year. They were paying me eight pounds fifty. The austerity itself was driven by a series of economic myths. But when you go to the data, you find there is no evidence for these myths. In particular, there is no evidence of unaffordability. Now, especially, we're going through really tough times. I've had three colleagues now, unfortunately, um, die within the last month, I think, what with COVID and the stress of all that. And it's very nice that everyone's going out the front and clapping. I think that's lovely to see Boris Johnson clapping. Um, until yesterday when obviously it's leaked that they're considering doing another um, pay cap again for the next two years. So it's a bit of a kick in the teeth. Especially in London, you don't, you don't get to leave anymore. You're just working to pay food and rent and, and that's it. When I first came here, it was difficult because I've got two sons and I had to send money home. Now, I would have found it very difficult. I probably would have gone home. A couple of years ago in 2018, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Poverty and Human Rights came and visited the UK and spoke to lots of people, more importantly listened to lots of people. It was absolutely damning about the situation in the UK and, and shocked that in a so-called civilised wealthy country so much deprivation and poverty could exist. It's a totally mechanical economic analysis that ignores the damage that I think is being done to the fabric of British society, to the sense of community, which has been built in part around the sports centres, the recreation places, the public lands that are being sold off, the libraries that are being closed down, the youth centres that are being downsized, and soon there will be nowhere for people in the lower income groups to go. It was useful having somebody from the United Nations flagging it up. Unfortunately, the media didn't pick it up very much. Um, I would like, I think it should have been splashed across all the, all the front pages that the United Nations is, is saying that the UK was too much poverty and inequality. The topics that we looked at was rising inequality in the US and the UK. And when I, start, when I looked at the data there, I realised the problem was much more serious. From the Bank of England data of the level of debt in the UK for the last 300 years. And it's really shocking. And I kept looking and I kept analysing more. The more I looked, the more serious I realised it was. It's not high compared with the 300 year average. Look how high it was just before the Industrial Revolution took off. Look how high it was after the Second World War, just before we had the golden age of capitalists. Until the end, the end, I thought, no, I have to stop consulting. I should 
write a book about this, which is the 99% book, and I should set up an organisation to try and do something about it. The solutions exist, and I think we just need to listen to the people who've got them. We're really in a position where we always feel able to look after ourselves. We're not able to take our breaks. We're not able to say, actually, you know what, I'm really struggling at the moment. What can I do just to change things a little bit? Um, and again, the pay just alongside it should really, really be matching. Everyone, if they're hard workers, they, they can make a change. To not accept to work for for any amount of money and put put some price on your on yourself. There's there's this rap group from America, Blackbird Zombies, and one of the one of the guys is saying in one verse that you are telling me that one hour of my life worth eight pounds an hour. The most harmful myth is that we can't afford to do any better than we're doing now. Investments in R&D, investments in healthcare, investments, for example, in uh, greening the economy, all of those things would grow the pie, but also help to share it more fairly. We need to change is the idea about the role of the state. And I think the old parties, for example, the right want to shrink the state, feel that the state shouldn't be interfering in our lives. And the old fashioned left sometimes wants a huge state that, that is rather domineering and doesn't give enough space for people's creativity, innovation and local community activity. It is not that difficult to reverse course and to end mass impoverishment. A government should be governing for the benefit of the whole population. It shouldn't be leaving the 99% behind in order to cater for the wishes of the 1% who actually fund the political parties, for example. As it's just a moment that lasts half a minute, but I think, you know what, this is why I went into nursing. And it's just an honor to be there in people's worst moments. And it always make it right, but you can make it a little bit better. Some people say, I think you will find that people tend to get paid what they're worth. When I look at the real world, I just don't see that. I don't see evidence that the people who are best paid are the people who are doing most good for society.